No doubt about it. It looks like Breonna Taylor might have gotten a pretty raw deal. There has been new information released about the case, and it starts to look to me like perhaps the grand jury was not quite provided all the information they needed to make a good decision on whether the officers in that case were guilty or not. So today we're going to look at a new video that's come out. It's somewhat of a simulation of what took place that night. You know, I have to admit that I was not quite prepared for this at all. So we're going to see, and I'll be making commentary uh, throughout the time. I do want to start off with something, though, and I'm afraid that people are going to call this whataboutism. But I want to make it clear that people of color, you are not the only ones that have been victimized by something like this. And I've brought this up before in a previous video. In Houston, we had a very similar thing happen. Police with a no-knock warrant busted into a house, shot two people, a married couple, and their dog, killed all three of them. So let me show you a picture of the victims. There they are. And why were they served this warrant? Well, it turns out that a police officer faked the evidence to get the no-knock warrant. He claimed that there was an informant that had told him that he had purchased drugs out of the house. The informant never existed. This officer lied to the judge so that he could get a no-knock warrant on the house. They went in there, busted in, got into a firefight, killed both those people. By the way, uh, here is the uh, police officer. The one on the left, last name is Goins, and the one on the right is somewhat of an accomplice in the whole deal, although he was mostly involved in trying to cover the thing up. This situation was worse than Breonna's. Breonna Taylor's warrant was a little bit suspicious. I mean, I don't know if it was a very good warrant, but it wasn't faked. This dude on the left faked the warrant. He faked the evidence to get it. And evidently, he's been doing it before. So we're not here to talk about these guys. Uh, I have another video on this uh, terrible incident but we're here to talk about Breonna Taylor, and so we'll go ahead and get her started. Hello out there. I am trying to get through. With his powerful brain waves cradled in the warmth of reasoning, it's time for Johnny Walker Dread to straighten you out on a thing or two. Emanating all the way from exciting Las Vegas, Oklahoma, it's the Johnny Walker Dread Show. Okay, so... This was provided by the New York Times. Uh, it's going to be a little bit biased. As far as I can tell, it's fairly accurate. I'm going to make that assumption that what we are going to see here is accurately portrayed. Now, maybe in the comments, you may want to correct me if I'm wrong. So let's take a look and see what they have to say. The focus of the police investigation on March 13th is not Taylor's apartment, but properties 10 miles away in West Louisville. Hands behind your back, boss. Executing a search warrant. Come out. Where dozens of SWAT and police officers arrest an ex-boyfriend of Taylor's and his associates, and seize evidence including drugs. Now they say that the focus originally was not her apartment. That's misleading. Her apartment was part of the deal here, so they're trying to shift it away and basically say that, well, the police were really after this other place. And that kind of feeds in that conspiracy theory that they had been knocking on the wrong door when they went into Breonna's apartment. That's simply not true. Breonna was on the search warrant. They were looking for her. These officers are wearing their body cameras and they carry out the raid safely and without incident. What the SWAT team doesn't know is that at this time, a hastily assembled team of narcotics officers is about to raid Taylor's home across town. They mentioned that these officers are wearing their body cameras and nothing happened, trying to make a correlation that somehow the reason why the police officers shot up Breonna Taylor's apartment was because they weren't wearing their body cameras. I think that's a bit unfair. They suspect her ex-boyfriend keeps cash or drugs there, but their intel is poor. They don't know she has a new boyfriend and they think she lives alone. When seven officers begin the raid at 12.40 a.m., they notice the lights are off except for the flicker of a TV in a bedroom. The light on the bedroom, the TV. 
I remember seeing it lit up blue or when we pulled up. Suggesting they know where Taylor is, in less than three minutes, she would be fatally shot. Inside, Taylor had dozed off while watching a movie with her boyfriend, Kenneth Walker. Adjacent is the bedroom of Taylor's sister, but she's not home. A hallway from the bedrooms leads to a living area, and the apartment's entrance is in this breezeway. I do like this layout here. Now I understand a little bit more about what took place. The light is this lamp opposite her door, where now the police begin to stack. In this reconstruction, we hear the official testimonies given by the two officers nearest the door, Mattingly and Nobles, Cosgrove, who's providing cover, and Hoover and Hankinson beside them. And we'll hear from neighbours and Kenneth Walker, who was interviewed by police right after the shooting. When we all got up in line, I knocked on the door, banged on it, just as Mattingly begins to knock, a man emerges from the apartment directly. Well, that's rather interesting. They had a no-knock warrant, but they knocked anyway. In my opinion, if you have a no-knock warrant, you don't knock. And the reason why is when you knock, you alert the people inside, which allows them to arm themselves in case you're going to barge in. The whole point of getting a no-knock warrant is to be able to gain entry before the occupants inside have an opportunity to do anything about it. When you knock, you defeat the purpose of it. So I would suggest to the officers here that they probably should not have knocked. I'm not a police officer, however, and I could be wrong. Directly above. He doesn't live there, but is picking up his child after finishing work. The door right there, that's why the baby sit on me, so I can go pick up my little girl. A squabble with Detective Brett Hankison and Sue's, and already the team seems on edge. I remember Brett extending his gun saying, get back in your apartment, get back in your apartment. Brett was a little bit worked up. I remember looking at Brett saying, Brett, relax. Brett, just relax, relax. The man and so we're already seeing some conflict here, and that's not going to play well to a jury when this goes up. Treats inside. The police are supposed to be conducting a knock and announce raid, but that's not what Mattingly says happens at first. We didn't announce the first couple because our intent was to give her plenty of time to come to the door. Now I'm a little bit confused. It was supposed to be a no-knock warrant or a knock and announce. Which one was it? Because the media reports had all said that this was a no-knock warrant. And that was sort of the impetus for a lot of people to ban no-knock warrants was this case here. Hmm. Inside, Taylor wakes up. So it's a loud bang at the door. She pops up out of sleep and scared her to death. Me too. Like, who is that? Banged on the door, no response. Banged on it again, no response. At that point, we started announcing ourselves. And that's going to be key. Did they really announce themselves? And, and I'm telling you, if you're going to announce yourself, you better be loud. You had better let everybody in that entire apartment complex know that the police are there. Whether the police announce themselves clearly enough is a critical issue in this story that we'll return to later on. Not knowing who's at the door this late, Walker grabs his licensed handgun. Another knock at the door. She's like, who is it? Loud at the top of her words. No response. So I'm like, what the heck? They rush to get dressed and walk toward the door. Never even made it like mid-hallway. But as loud as we were screaming to say who it is, I know whoever would be on the other side of the door could hear us. Outside, some of the police do hear Taylor. I can hear somebody inside. I kept telling John, I can hear her. But after knocking and waiting for around 45 seconds, they decided they've given her enough time to respond and rammed the door open. The last time, as I said, let's just hit it. And that's when we did the you know, police search warrant. We'll show here what the police and Walker describe seeing next. And I hit it. After the third hit, it flew open. And that's when it hit the fan. As we're coming to the door, the door light comes off the hinges like an explosion. The officers now make a tactical mistake. Mattingly steps into the doorway and puts himself in what police describe as the fatal funnel. Well, and here's the problem. He has to gain entry by going through the doorway, but he's absolutely right. The fatal funnel is some area where you just simply have no way of moving laterally and it makes it for an easy target for the person on the other side. Uh, stairwells are notorious for this, so going up a stairwell is always a very dangerous thing to do. There's just nowhere that you can go, and especially if the person's above you position vulnerable to gunfire and hard to move from. I could see down the hallway and there's a the male and a female side by side, shoulder to shoulder. It, almost like they were together. The apartment is lit only by the breezeway light that's coming from behind Mattingly 
and the faint glare of the TV in Taylor's bedroom. You can't see anybody, though. It was dark. There was no light. Well, okay, that's a problem. And when you're going to bust into a place that's dark, they have that amber light behind them. So if they're in the light, the other ones are not. That puts them in a serious disadvantage. I don't know if they had, should have brought in some lighting of some sort, flashlights or what, but going into a dark room and you have no idea if they're armed on the other side, man, I wouldn't want to do it. Thinking it's an intruder, Walker aims low, shoots once, and hits Mattingly in the thigh. I feel like I aim down because I wouldn't, of course, I'm, I don't need to kill anybody. And so I just let off one shot. Mattingly immediately returns. And that's one thing you have to be kind of careful about, and that is making claims that you didn't try to actually stop the threat, but just wound it. Uh, that can get you into a lot of trouble in certain states. Uh, you, normally, the idea is, is that if you are going to claim self-defense, then you have to state that you actually tried to shoot the person's center mass. In other words, to essentially neutralize the threat as much as possible. Uh, claims that you only aim for the legs or try to do warning shots can get you into a lot of trouble. And that's the reason why you have to know your state laws. Talk to your lawyer. And if you're going to have a concealed gun permit, make sure that you understand what you can and cannot do with it. It's fire. I got four rounds off and it was like boom, 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 boom. Then all of a sudden there's a whole lot of shots. Mattingly fires two more rounds when he falls and takes cover. Almost at the same time, Cosgrove moves in and fires, stepping on Mattingly in the process. And here, what I would have done, and again, I'm not a police officer, but I think that most police officers probably agree with me, but when you bust in, you have a no-knock warrant or a knock-and-announce warrant, and this starts to happen. You start getting shots going back and forth. I think you need to get out of there. I think you need to step back and try to figure out what's going on. To try to gain entry at this point is just ludicrous. I, I think that you have lost the element of surprise, and the other persons are armed, you're going to be going through a fatal funnel with a light behind you. I think I've also would have unscrewed that lamp. He has now also put himself in the fatal funnel, and although he's shooting, he appears to have no idea what's happening. I see blinding, vivid, white light and blackness at the same time. I don't hear any gunfire at all, ever, and I did not have any pain, sensation, or any recollection that, that I'm firing. And so I hope that these detectives had talked through their lawyer first and find out what is going to fly and what is not. This doesn't look good to me. I mean, I'm just a just typical citizen sitting on the side of the road listening to this, but, you know, I couldn't hear any shots. I'm not sure what was going on. That's not good. I mean, it's kind of like you're trying to hope that you can get out of this thing by pretending you didn't know what was happening, but that's not going to fly in court, I have a feeling. He continues shooting blindly until he runs out of ammunition, a total of 16 rounds. If you told me I didn't fire a gun, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be like, okay, I believe you. Yeah, and that's just not good. I, I hope that they talk to the lawyers first before issuing that. Uh, he emptied out 16 rounds, and again, I just think that you have to just back away from this situation and go back and regroup and figure out what you're going to do. This is not like the people inside have a kidnapping, you know, a, a hostage or or something like that where immediacy is important. Yeah, they might have drugs and they may be flushing them down the toilet, but I don't think rushing in here, yeah, that's not enough of an emergency to really press forward with this no-knock warrant at this point. But again, I think that officers watching the show may want to join in the comments and tell me if I'm wrong. In response to Walker's shot, Mattingly and Cosgrove together fire four shots into a chair, cupboards, and a stove in the kitchen. And that's going to be interesting uh, about this because those shots are not ricochets. I, I can't see any ricochets that would do that. There's not much inside the apartment as far as I would imagine that would ricochet a bullet like that. It seems like they're just firing wildly. And again, if you're to the point where you're going to be shooting like that, I think the better alternative is to just get out of there and try to regroup and maybe even call it off. Two bullets go into the ceiling and pass through the living room in the apartment above, where the man, his two-year-old daughter and babysitter waited. Three more shots go into the living room wall to the right, and the officers fire 13 rounds down the hallway where Taylor and Walker stood. Taylor is shot six times on both sides of her body, in the abdomen and chest, her arm and leg, and twice in her foot. In all, 
these two officers fired 22 rounds in less than a minute. An FBI ballistics report found that both of them shot Taylor, and that one of the 16 rounds Cosgrove fired was the lethal bullet. We both dropped to the ground, but I just hear her screaming, you know, and... Thinking they're under attack, some of the officers flee when they hear a pause in shooting. There was a little bitty moment of no shots. I was like, here's the time to go, and then it all started up again. We don't know the precise sequence of events, but Detective Hankinson runs to the front. I can hear the firing as I'm going, as I'm making the corner. I can see the flashes, the muzzle flashes. But the only ones shooting are police. Even though all the curtains are drawn, Hankinson blindly fires five bullets through the patio windows. Yeah, this one's kind of tough to uh, defend. Uh, you have to know what you're shooting at. And I remember the case in uh, it was Northern California near Sacramento, I believe. Maybe it was Modesto. I'm not sure where they had uh, people who had robbed a bank and had some hostages and they were driving down and, and they were very heavily armed, I think with AK-47s. And police just simply blasted the car to smithereens. And at one point, an officer even said that he was just shooting at the car, but you can't. I mean, you have to have your target lined up and you have to be aiming at it. Uh, I don't quite understand why he did this. My only option was to turn fire, and I did that to the muzzle flashes. He moves and fires five more rounds through the bedroom window of Taylor's sister, who isn't home. Two bullets fly over Walker and Taylor, but none hits them. The bullets that go into the living area pass over Taylor's sofa and kitchen table and smash her clock. Three penetrate the wall and enter her neighbor's apartment. Those bullets also smash the kitchen table, hit a wall, and shatter the patio doors at the rear. A pregnant woman, her son and partner were home. Hankinson has been charged with wantonly endangering their lives. Social media made too much of this. They, they said that, well, the only person being charged is the one that didn't even shoot at Breonna Taylor. Well, in a way, he was trying to shoot Breonna and Kenneth Walker. I think he just his tactics were very terrible. I mean, you just... He is not even saying that he even has an outline of a person. He's just shooting out a muzzle flash, and although it's not even clear that that's what he even saw. So he, in his mind, he was shooting at a threat, but I just really don't think that that was a good idea. And I think that most law enforcement will tell you that's irresponsible. In total, the police fire 32 bullets, penetrating almost every room in Taylor's apartment. They hit saucepans, cereal boxes, and smash into her shower. They puncture shoes, shatter cleaning equipment, and land in her sister's clothing. And, three minutes after police came to search her home, a fatally wounded tailor is lying on the ground. I'm just panicking and I'm telling somebody, I'm yelling help. Cause she's right here bleeding and nobody's coming and I'm just confused and scared and I feel the same right now. That's it. <clears throat> Months later, when Attorney General Daniel Cameron presented the charges against Hankison and said that Mattingly and Cosgrove's actions were justified, he emphasized that police did properly announce themselves. Evidence shows that officers both knocked and announced their presence at the apartment. But actually, the evidence is far from clear. In 911 calls immediately after the shooting, Taylor's neighbors don't know police are carrying out a raid. Please get a um, uh, uh, police out here. They are shooting back. Something's going on next door, and there's bullet holes all the way through the wall, through our glass. I have a five-year-old in here, so something needs to be explained to me. Something needs to be explained to me. That's kind of a strange thing to say. I'd be saying, like, get somebody over here as fast as you can. Uh, so it's like she's, like, upset, disturbed, annoyed about the whole thing. But they do not mention anything about the police, and that's kind of important. And in statements police took afterwards, none of Taylor's neighbors heard the officers announce. This apartment's patio door was open. I mean, I was... Completely unaware that it was that, that it was cops. 
Two teenagers in this apartment heard a commotion, but didn't hear police announce through their open window, their mom said. They told me that nothing was said, that they just beat on the door. I said, so y'all don't know if it was them? She was like, they didn't say nothing, they just beat on the door. And the family who lived directly above Taylor also heard nothing. Before the gunshots come out, did you hear anything? Conversations or anything like that, people talking? No. One thing that's important to understand is that eyewitness testimony is not very reliable. Now, the phone calls that were called in were the people were calling this in and not mentioning the police, that's pretty important. I think that that's fairly reliable. If the people thought that the police were there, I think they would have mentioned it. Any kind of interviews after the fact, however, are going to be a suspect, especially in a highly charged event like this. Uh, the reason why is, as we found in the Michael Brown case, people lie. I mean, once they find out that the cops are kind of in some trouble, they will fabricate testimony in order to try to convict them. And don't tell me they don't. They do. We know that from the Michael Brown case, where quite a few number of eyewitnesses completely fabricated their testimony in order to try to get the cops convicted. And how do we know they fabricated it? They admitted it. It turns out that these nice, grandiose claims that you think is going to get the pigs in trouble doesn't work out well when you're facing perjury charges. No. In their statements and in interviews with The Times, over a dozen neighbours say they did not hear the police. Attorney General Cameron's assertion rests on the accounts of police officers and a single witness, Aaron Sarpy, the man collecting his daughter that night and who saw the police when he came outside. In his first interview with investigators, Sarpy was asked what he heard when he went back inside. Did you ever hear anyone identify themselves as police? No, nobody identified themselves. And that's pretty assertive. I mean, he's, he's not saying, well, I didn't hear it or anything like that. He's saying, no, nobody identified themselves. That's kind of important. Months later, he told police his memory was foggy, but that he thought officers did announce. And beyond what the police said... This critical grand jury conclusion rested on his entirely inconsistent account. I'm not certain that the grand jury was given all of the information they needed, though, and that's going to be important here. I think that this is going to go back into a grand jury, and they're going to look at this again. The officers are facing murder charges. In my opinion, this isn't really murder. This is more of a reckless manslaughter or whatever you have. it. I don't think that the police went there with the intention of killing anybody. However, if they truly made some serious mistakes here, they have to pay the piper. I mean, there's you just can't go and kill people with impunity. I mean, there has to be a price to pay if somebody is to blame. And it looks to me like the police may have made a lot of mistakes here. I don't think, though, they had any evil intent at all. I think that they went in there with some very poor tactics and simply made some mistakes, but we'll see. After the raid, the scene outside is chaos. Officers tend to Mattingly, but an ambulance that had been staging nearby is nowhere to be found. Fuck this EMS. Somebody give me the radio SWAT on it. They radio the SWAT officers across town. EMS on Springfield. Who are surprised by the call. We're Springfield. They're requesting armor down there. Yeah, we're Springfield. They weren't even aware that something was taking place. Uh, you have a no-knock warrant. It can be a dangerous situation. EMS should have been on the, on the alert for this. We're going to go ahead and take it. Let's go, let's go, let's, let's go. go. They head for Taylor's address. It's an apartment. Well, I didn't know they were in that night. I knew it was part of the investigation. As SWAT arrives, close to 40 police vehicles are already at the scene. Jesus. This is something that just aggravates me. You know, you have a shooting. you got some people that have been shot. One of them has died. Uh, you have some officers involved. You don't need 40 police cars, but here's what happens. These police officers hear this going on, and they just all dive in their cars and drive on over. I'm not sure how many of these officers really needed to be there. I mean, how many police cars do you need for a single shooting like this? Around this time, Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, is being arrested. He's been hit by a bullet. Keep walking backwards. Hey, come on. And something has been made about that. Uh, somebody asked him, have you been hit by a bullet or something to that effect? 
And he says no, and the cop says that's unfortunate. And everybody is making a claim, well, that just shows you how callous the cop is. Keep in mind, you have to be very careful about these things. You don't know if the cop heard what the person said. You don't know if that statement was made in reference to something else by somebody else. And so you've got to be careful about jumping to conclusions. I don't think that the cop said that's unfortunate because he thought that the guy should have been shot. I just don't buy that. Well, we need to get moving because there might be a victim inside. Keep Keep walking backwards! You're scared, right? Walk back, Allison! It's up! Walk back to me! Walker had. Shut up. I mean, really, you have the person, he's got his hands up, you got the lights on him. Just tell him to come to you. But this sort of like come back, walk back slowly, or I'll sick this dog on you, in my opinion, it's unnecessary. He's got his hands up. Just have him walk towards you. Calls 911. A neighbor said heard his pleas for help. You want to fucking prison? That's what's going on. But at 1 a.m., almost. That was uncalled for. Uh, you know, you don't know if the person is a victim or you don't know anything. I understand that these are highly charged moments. And I, I can see how people can shoot their mouths off in these situations, but. You're a professional, not supposed to be making comments like that. How do you know that the man has committed any crimes? It's 20 minutes after the shooting, the police still don't know Taylor is critically injured inside. There's somebody in there dead? Yeah, my girlfriend, it's her house. Can we go in? We have to go in if there's somebody. Yeah. What, what is this about? My girlfriend is dead. I don't get, keep walking. As Walker is being led out, SWAT gets ready to secure the apartment. Hey, there's a kid upstairs. He's not. There's a kid upstairs. Little kid. What the? Hey, front door. Front door. Front door. Yeah, front door. Moving. Short. 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 Clear. Clear. Left side clear. Go ahead and get EMS in here. I'm gonna check your pulse. Only now, half an hour after the raid began, does an EMT finally check Taylor. But half an hour later. But keep in mind, I'm not certain how soon they could have gotten in there and checked on her. Uh, part of the problem here was the poor planning. They should have had people ready. If you're going to go and do a warrant search like that late at night, I think you'd have to have people around. The reason why I think it took a half an hour is I think it took a long time to get people assembled. And later, as two officers stand guard, they take in the scene. They see Taylor's uniform. She worked as an emergency room technician in city hospitals. Irrelevant. They note the bullet holes. Body level. Hey, can anybody advise if we talk to the neighbors directly above this apartment? There's gunshot holes in the ceilings. Gunshot holes in the ceilings. That's kind of hard to explain. It just looks to me like they just panic and can't do that. And I think part of the issue is that I'm not sure, again, I'm not an officer, so I would have to ask them, but I think when you're going to do a no-knock warrant, you have to put in your mind, what if? I mean, what if we kick that door open and we hear gunshots going off? People are shooting at us. What am I going to do? I don't think they were ready for that. They kicked the door in. All of a sudden, the, sh the shots started coming, and I had a feeling that they just simply came uncorked. But we have to keep an open mind. Outside, the SWAT officers debrief on what they've seen. Hey, camera's off there, bike. Yeah, mine's off. This is the part one I said they didn't use. Uh, telling them to turn the cameras off, that could be an issue. I don't know what's going to go on with that, but uh, you have to be kind of careful about that kind of thing. Um, are you turning off the cameras to hide evidence or hide testimony or something? It just doesn't look good. I think they should have just left them on. The SWAT commander who was called to Taylor's home after the raid was later interviewed by investigators. We just got the feeling that night that something really bad happened. Dale Massey, a 20-year police veteran, was highly critical of what unfolded. He said there was no coordination with SWAT. We had no idea they were going to be at that apartment that night. I would have advised them 100% not to do it. And that executing another warrant at the same time may have compromised Taylor's safety. Uh, he will be on the stand probably. He is expert testimony, and this is not going to do the officers much good. But keep in mind, I think that the issue here is more of a poor tactics, poor reactions, not so much intent. I don't think that the officers went there with any intent to hurt anyone.
we treat safety very important, right? So like simultaneous warrants, bad business. Narcotics officers testified that they didn't know Taylor had a new boyfriend, that her sister lived there, or that her two-year-old goddaughter regularly stayed. Okay, now I have an objection to this. Uh, this is another th bad thing that the news media does. We have to be able to judge this event based on what happened. And this blame of Breonna Taylor in a very positive light here, she's happy and stuff, that's for another time. If you're really going to put together a, a documentary here that try to get at what took place, this has no business being there. But the news media today just can't resist it. So they'll drag out the photos of the uh, people in their graduation gowns and, and such, but it doesn't belong in this, in a serious investigation. Massey said the department had a history of poor intelligence gathering. Back in the day, we would take a lot of detective information and take it as, as golden, not anymore, because so often there's no kids, there's no dogs, we're told there's kids and dogs. So we have an exhaustive recon process that we go through. Now, the question would be, is that going to help the officers or not? I mean, uh, how culpable are they for how the police department as a whole collects information? It's not easy to say. He said standing in the doorway, the fatal funnel, as Mattingly and Cosgrove had, was a tactical mistake. Is it practical or is it even common for three people to be in what we consider the fatal funnel? Absolutely not, no. Uh -huh. You would never put you know, yourself in that situation. and that there's a right way and a wrong way to conduct a raid. You knock, announce, and give people ample time to leave. We're not going to rush in to get dope. We're not, we're not going to treat human life more important than any amount of dope, right? And just to be clear, no drugs were ever found at Taylor's. That's true. However, that's not an issue here. Uh, it doesn't matter. The warrant is not on these officers. It, it's not their fault whether there was any drugs found inside. They were issued a warrant. They were told to go do a no-knock warrant on this place, and th they did their job. That doesn't look like they necessarily did it very well, but they did their job, and it's not their fault that there were no drugs inside. His harshest criticism was of Hankinson's blind shots into the apartment. You have to know, A, what you're shooting at, B, what's in front of it, and B, what's behind it. There's no other way you can operate. It was just an egregious act. Under Kentucky law, Kenneth Walker had a right to stand his ground against what he believed was an aggressor. It doesn't have to do with stand your ground. This is castle doctrine. He's in his home. Um, yes, he may not be the actual owner, but he's with the person that is. So he has the right to defend himself. It's not stand your ground. I mean, he has nowhere to go. People misunderstand this. Uh, stand your ground is not in cases uh, like this where you have people busting in your home and you fire back. It's meant for cases where you had an opportunity to flee and you chose not to. But the Castle Doctrine pretty well negates this anyway. I'm assuming that Kentucky has a castle doctrine very much like most states. And in fact, I'd be shocked if it didn't because uh, Kentucky is a fairly conservative state. And the police in turn have a right to self-defense. But in this analysis, the killing of Breonna Taylor resulted from poor planning compounded by reckless execution. Louisville has instituted police reforms and Taylor's family received a substantial settlement. But the case isn't closed. Investigations and lawsuits are ongoing, and nine months after Taylor was killed, her family is seeking a fresh inquiry into the officers involved. You know, so we can see it there. Of course, you have a really uh, nice shot here of the uh, victim because this is all part of the deal. By the way, if you'll notice something, take a look at the photographs that they show of the people that were shot in Houston. And you can see sort of the difference, right? Uh, there's no effort. There's no effort here whatsoever to find nice photos of them uh, drinking, having a good time, and stuff like that. These look like mug shots here. They might be actually. I mean, I'm not saying that these people have never been in trouble with the law, but you can see how the news media kind of treats these things. Well, I have not investigated the Breonna Taylor to the depths I have of the Kyle Rittenhouse deal, so I might have some of my facts wrong. And if I do, by all means, correct me. Uh, however, I do think that the police officers hold some culpability here. I just don't think that you can do that kind of thing. You, when you have that many shots being shot wildly into the ceilings, into everything, uh, th there has to be some sort of explanation for this, and the explanation doesn't look too good. However, I would like to hear 
a little bit more from them about why this took place. Uh, we only got little snippets from it. And of course, Cameron's decision not to present this evidence to the grand jury in terms of a murder, potential murder charges, rather interesting as well. Usually a prosecutor is going to do that because a prosecutor is wanting to prosecute. And here it comes off that he's trying to defend the police in this matter, and that's not his job. And uh, I, th I think he's got some explaining to do. I'm not saying he, he's guilty of anything yet, but I'm a little bit skeptical of his side of things. If you have other videos that you would like me to see and, and comment on when it comes to Breonna Taylor that might paint things a little differently, if you have some documentation you want me to look at that might correct the record, more than happy to look at it. I want to get this right. If I really have my doubts about their culpability, about their innocence, I'm going to say so. Like my video and subscribe to my channel.